suddenly saw, you know, the War of 1812 from a different perspective. And it taught you that history is subjective. I suddenly realized, well, you know, different, it depends on where you're standing. It led to a certain sense of alienation. Um, I was a foreigner in my own country. I was a foreigner in India. <laughs> um, and I think that's also, that experience sort of was part of the motivation for me to, to begin to write and be a reporter. from KIS Class 2021. And with me today is Kai Bird, author, columnist, and winner of the 20 2006 Pulitzer Prize for his biography of J. Robert Oppenheimer. Having spent his childhood in multiple cities such as Cairo, Jerusalem, and Mumbai, Kai's interests lie particularly towards Middle Eastern politics. He even wrote a paper on the Palestinian question during his time in Kodi. After graduating from Puri School in 1969, he went to study his BA at Carlton College and received his MS in journalism from Northwestern University. Kai's works include the critically acclaimed biography, Crossing Mandelbaum Gate, Coming of Age Between the Arabs and Israelis, as well as The Good Spy, The Life and Death of Robert Ames, a CIA officer whose work extensively focused on the Middle East. In addition, he's the executive di director of the Leon Levi Center for Biography at the City University of New York Graduate Center and the recipient of several awards such as the National Book Critics Circle Award for Biography, the Duff Cooper Prize, a Woodrow Wilson Center Fellowship, as well as the Guggenheim Fellowship. Thank you for joining us today. We're so happy to have you here. To start off, I just wanted to ask about your career origins and interest. What drew you to writing, and in particular, writing biographies? How and when did you realize that you were best suited to telling other people's stories? <laughs> uh, well, thank you for having me, Mega. It's uh, lovely to be with you. And, you know, I had a great experience at Cody, and it really did sort of... Uh, formulate my interests and, and got me going intellectually. Um, and you're right, uh, you know, to mention this, the fact that I wrote a paper on the Middle East while I was a, a senior in Cody. And uh, it got me involved in trying to write about history and politics and uh, the very complicated Arab-Israeli conflict. But when I left Cody, you know, to go to college, I sort of in the back of my mind, I actually, you know, you never know what you want to do, really. You're so young. Um, I sort of thought I might go to law school. But in college uh, in Minnesota, which was a very strange thing to go from India to Minnesota, um, I, I, at one point, I was so homesick for India and uh, that I persuaded one of my professors to allow me to do an independent study back in South Asia for a semester. And I ended up landing in Bombay on the last day of the 1971 war in December, 1971. And so of course it was, there was a great deal of chaos and um, confusion and uh, this was, we were all witnessing the creation of Bangladesh. Uh, so my thought for my independent study was to go and write a paper about the involvement of the students in Dhaka University in the 
liberation struggle. And so I managed to get myself to Bangladesh, um, flying into Calcutta and then land traveling across to Dhaka uh, with a TV crew that was associated with CBS Evening News. And Dhaka was in great chaos. It was just after the war. And I sort of stumbled into journalism there. Um, I was doing research for my paper, going around interviewing students about their involvement in the liberation struggle. And uh, it was all very exciting and horrific. And, um, and at some point I ran into some journalists and one was a, the bureau chief for United Press International. And he was going up to up country, Northern Bangladesh for a week to do reporting. And he needed somebody to stay in the office and um, man the office as such. So he hired me for a week. That was my first job as a journalist. <laughs> And uh, it, it got me hooked. Uh, this is a long story to, by which to tell you that I, I got hooked on journalism from that trip and um, wrote my first article uh, about uh, something that had happened in Bangladesh that week. And it went out on the wire service with my byline, Kai Bird. And I was all of you know 20 years old. <laughs> so, but it, it, I thought this was really cool. And uh, so I went back to college, finished, and, and I was determined to become a reporter. And uh, let's see, to finish answering your question, you know, I, I finished college. I went, I got a, a, scholar, a travel scholarship that allowed me to do freelance journalism in the Middle East and in, in India. And I went back to Bangladesh um, and spent a year doing that. Then I came back, went to journalism school to get a master's in journalism at Medill in Northwestern University. And then again, went back overseas after that year and freelanced. And you know, then I, I eventually got a job at Newsweek in New York. And then after that, with The Nation magazine in New York. And so I was a working journalist for uh, about 10 years. And, you know, I had a great time, but uh, I guess I sort of thought as a young journalist in my late 20s that uh, every reporter at some point should try to write a book. So, I eventually stumbled on a, what I thought was a great idea for a book that I thought would take two years. And it turned into a biography of John J. McCloy, a powerful Wall Street lawyer in New York, who was still alive then. And it took me 10 years only. <laughs> so, um, and by the end of the 10 years, I had a, a great book that was well reviewed everywhere, but um, I had no longer been, you know, I hadn't been working as a reporter for many of those years. And uh, the next logical thing was to write, write another book. So that's what got me started. But Right, moving on to your time at Cody School, um, do you think that your time at Cody has had a profound impact on your identity, especially because you spent a lot of your formative years in places like Cairo and Jerusalem, and I think those provided an environment that was almost entirely different to Cody at the time. So to what extent do you think the schools had a very profound impact on your identity and you as a person? Well, you're right. I, you know, spent my childhood in places like Jerusalem and Beirut and Cairo and Saudi Arabia because my father was a foreign service officer. Um, uh, so I grew up as sort of an American expatriate, really not knowing very much about American life or you know, 
I didn't know the culture very well. I didn't understand uh, the baseball teams and football teams. I wasn't into sports. I didn't know the TV shows that most American kids had grown up with. Um, and when I, whenever I went back to America on visits, it seemed like I was part of it, but not, not of it. And uh, Cody, saying, going to Cody just was actually deepened my uh, sense of being something other. Uh, I, Cody was, when I arrived there, it was such a, a, a big change of pace for me as well, because it was a boarding school. I was 16 years old. I was there for, you know, alone without my parents or sisters for the first time. And, uh, you know, in 1968, when I arrived there, it was still very much a missionary school. It was, uh, there were a few Indian nationals, uh, my good friend Ashok, <laughs> who was the son of a tea plantation owner in Tamil Nadu. Um, but most of the most of the kids were the sons and daughters of missionaries, and you know they were Southern Baptists and Mennonites and Congregationalists, all sorts of different Christian sects. Not Catholics; <laughs> they were all Protestant, and they were very you know they were pretty conservative. Um, and so it, I I was entering a world that was like from partly from the 19th century, it seemed to me, <laughs> and uh, partly this strange missionary culture where these, you know, my classmates, most of them, many of them had been born in India and their first language was Telugu or Tamil or Hindi, um, but they, spoke fluent English, and they thought of themselves as Americans, but they only went back to America every five years or so for mm. six months or maybe a year. And then they were back in India. And so they too weren't really Americans. Anyway, this whole experience for the next two years impressed upon me, um, you know, that I was, a person of, that I was an American citizen, but I wasn't from anywhere. And uh, it led to a certain sense of alienation. Um, I was a foreigner in my own country. I was a foreigner in India. <laughs> um, and I think that's also, that experience sort of, was part of the motivation for me to, to begin to, uh, it led to a certain sense of alienation. Um, I was a foreigner in my own country. I was a foreigner in India. <laughs> um, and I think that's also, that experience sort of was part of the motivation for me to, to begin to write and be a reporter. And in your memoir, you did mention how you were sent to Cody primarily because your parents wanted to Americanize you. And I know the memoir, you also outlined how that was a bit of a failure and you did have a bit of a tough time settling back, you know, once you moved back to the States for university. Right. And, right, and I just wanted to know, like, um, with the Deep South, you mentioned that when you went to Georgia, you felt like it was a foreign country, but when you went to university, what aspects of American life did you find particularly difficult to settle into after your time at Cody? Well, Cody was such a self-contained little bub bubble. You know, everything was sort of provided for you. There was a routine. Um, and you were sort of also a privileged expatriate. And you, uh, and so when I landed in Minnesota as a freshman in college, you know, unlike all my classmates, 
I didn't know how to drive a car. I, I never made a long distance phone call. <laughs> you know, they had real telephones, not, to, not cell phones in those days. Um, you had to use pay phones. I didn't know how to do that. I'd, I'd never gone shopping in a supermarket. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know, you know, it was so strange to walk into a supermarket and see all these choices and uh, it, and and then you know people would ask me in a friendly way, way where I was from and I didn't know what to say. Um, if I said I I had just you know moved from India or you know Tamil Nadu, well they'd never heard of Tamil Nadu, <laughs> or let alone Cody Canal. Um, so I began to lie, and I said, "Oh, I'm from Oregon." because I actually was born in Oregon. <laughs> so it was very difficult. Um, and it was all sort of bewildering. And um, on top of which, and when I arrived in America in 1969, the country was really experiencing a cultural and political civil war over the Vietnam War. And uh, most of my contemporaries were very angry about the war. And uh, one of the first things I had to do when I arrived in Minnesota was to register for the draft because you, you're subject to being drafted into the army and I didn't want to go. And uh, you know, I immediately got caught up in anti-war demonstrations. And by the end of that first year, I was arrested um, blocking the doors of a draft induction center in Minneapolis. So I was a very angry um, and disaffected young man. <laughs> it was probably good I got, got out of America again pretty soon. <laughs> right, because I, I did go through um, your class yearbook and in the superlatives, um, I saw that you were awarded most likely to make up an excuse to get out of the draft and again from what you've mentioned like it does look pretty likely um moving on to your work first i wanted to discuss the magnum opus the pulitzer prize winning book um, Amer american prometheus the triumph and tragedy of j robert oppenheimer so to start off, could, um, because some of us might be a little unfamiliar with history, could you tell us who exactly J. Robert Oppenheimer was and what made you think his story was worth publishing along with your colleague Martin J. Sherwin? Well, J. Robert Oppenheimer is in the popular mind, he's, he's known as the father of the atomic bomb. Uh, he was an American physicist. Uh, who was born in 1904 and died in 1967, relatively young age. Um, and he was a brilliant physicist who in the 1920s, when he was a young man, he was on the cutting edge of this newly discovered uh, field called quantum physics. Um, and he was a, he was a very strange, young man, um, but very charismatic. He was a physicist, but he loved French poetry and English literature. Um, and, you know, at the age of 33, he was chosen to be the scientific director of the Manhattan Project. Uh, this is in like 1942. And uh, he, in two and a half years, built the bomb. And without, everyone says that without Oppenheimer uh, leading this team of 6,000 scientists, chemists, engineers in the secret city called Los Alamos in the desert of New Mexico, uh, it just, you know, the bomb wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have been invented as such in time to be used during the war. And of course, it was used on two Japanese cities at the end of, at the very end of the 
of World War II. And this too became sort of a tragedy in Oppenheimer's mind because he later realized that it, in, in his opinion, uh, he was given enough facts to realize that it probably was unnecessary, that the Japanese were already beginning to surrender and that the war was virtually over. And as he said, just three months later in a speech, he said the bomb was used on a virtually already defeated enemy. And it's a weapon for aggressors, not for defenders. Um, so his life in su as such was always marked by the atomic bomb. Um, but he was, he became a, an American hero. He was, you know, the most famous American scientist. His image was splashed on the covers of Life and Time magazines. And, um, and then in just nine years later in 1954, he was uh, put on trial. It was a political trial. It was a, actually a security hearing about whether or not he was to be trusted with a security clearance. And the reason this happened was that he had come out in opposition to the building of more bombs. Um, specific. And so he opposed the building of this, and this angered many powerful personalities in the American defense establishment. And so they went after him, and he became the chief sort of political victim of the McCarthy era, America in the early 50s. And so was stripped of, in 1954, he was stripped of his security clearance and uh, disinvited from speaking at universities around the country and almost lost his job at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. Uh, so it's a great tragedy, his life. And that's why the book is called American Prometheus, The Life and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer. But, right, because at the end of the day, I think the book ended up revealing Oppenheimer's life with a lot of detail, and that took 25 years, and that's longer than I've lived so far. So I think for the ordinary person, it becomes a little bit difficult to comprehend just how much work goes into writing a biography. So could you tell us a little bit about what this sort of research involves, especially considering that the time at which the book was written is very different from today where, you know, it's so much easier to gain access to information. So what was the procedure like? What does it involve to curate a biography of this nature? Yeah, great, great question. Um, well, it, first of all, it, it can be a lot of fun. It's a treasure hunt. You're um, going into archives, largely, um, and digging, you know, through papers, going box by box, folder by folder. So it's very laborious, time consuming. And you're looking for interesting correspondence, facts, little stories, anecdotes. And, um, you know, when Marty and I, well, when Marty started out on Oppenheimer, he was doing research in the Library of Congress where Oppenheimer's papers were. Um, and, you know, there are hundreds of boxes. So he would be sitting at the desk in the archive and finding every day, he was probably Xeroxing hundreds of pages at 25 cents a page, by the way. <laughs> so very old fashioned technology using the Xerox machine. Um, and likewise, I, I did the same thing with my McCloy biography and the Bundys. It was uh, a lot of archival work and then a lot of interviews. So Marty interviewed many of uh, Oppenheimer's associates, other physicists, students that he had studied under him. Um, his, I, I, I actually found his, one of Oppenheimer's uh, last secretaries when he was still at the Manhattan Project. And, and I found her here in Washington, DC and, and interviewed her. 
And, uh, you know, it, those interviews take time. You have to prepare for them days in advance, like you prepared to interview me. <laughs> and uh, you have to come up with questions and uh, a sort of plan of attack for how to conduct the conversation and to get someone to talk and tell stories. And then in those days, I would take a, a tape recorder and tape record the interview. And then I'd have to come back and slowly transcribe it. Um, nowadays, on my Carter project, I, you know, I have an iPhone and I can take pictures in the archive, zap, 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 and it goes much faster. And I can do interviews and uh, on the iPhone and then I can have them transcribed by a transcription service. And it comes back to me in a day, fully transcribed and very accurate. So yes, things have changed, but it's still very laborious work. So the last bit about American Prometheus. Um, in 2006, you and Martin J. Sherwin won the Pulitzer Prize for biography. Can you tell us about that moment? What did it feel like? Oh, well, it, it's the only prize, the Pulitzer Prize, that actually anyone ever remembers. <laughs> and it's the only prize that actually helps to sell books. Um, people seem to buy the book, even if they don't know much about the subject. If they know that it won the Pulitzer Prize, it, it, it uh, encourages people to buy books. So, you know, we'd worked on this, Marty had worked on it for 25 years, I'd worked on it for five years. Um, I felt it was a very good book and I was quite optimistic uh, that we might have a chance of winning the Pulitzer Prize. And Marty said I was uh, being foolish. <laughs> so uh, on the day of the announcement, you know, you have no idea who's been nominated uh, or not. And they, they just on, usually on a day in April, in the spring, uh, the Pulitzer Committee in New York uh, has a press conference and they announce the winners. And suddenly I got a, I was sitting here at this desk and I got a phone call uh, from my editor who said, you won the Pulitzer. So I, call, I, I immediately called my wife and she didn't believe me. <laughs> she didn't believe me. And uh, she got off the phone and went and, and checked on, on her computer to see the announcement herself. And only then did she believe me. Um, anyway, it was, a great, uh, it was a great feeling. It's a, a wonderful prize. And um, Marty was shocked but obviously very pleased to have won too. And it was really, you know, all due to him. Uh, it was his idea to do this. It was his inspiration and his 20 years of research and five years of writing that made it all possible. So I was very pleased to have been his friend and we're still friends. That's a miracle too, because authors, co-authors often don't get along. <laughs> right. Right. But yeah, congratulations, because I think the Pulitzer Prize is really like the top honor that someone could get for writing. And to be very fair, when Ms. Manjusha asked me to interview you and I read up on you, I was very intimidated. I was like, oh my God, okay, Pulitzer Prize winner. And it's just, it's a fantastic achievement. Like you've, it's done wonders for not only your work, but also the school. So thank you for being so good at what you do. Another work of yours that, again, was very critically acclaimed is The Good Spy, The Life and Death of Robert Ames. Um, what drew you to choose Robert Ames as the subject of your biography and what role, if any, did your love for Israel play in writing this book? 
Um, well, you know, everybody loves a good spy story. It's a very old uh, narrative in, in, in human culture, spies. And uh, we wonder about them, we love them, we hate them, and we're suspicious of them, and yet we're drawn to the whole narrative. And as it happens, uh, <clears throat> Robert Ames, when I was looking for a new project, I, I, I had just finished writing my memoir, um, Crossing Mon Mondelbaum Gate. And actually I was sitting in Kathmandu living there and uh, I had known Robert Ames as a child. He was our, my next door neighbor in Dahran, Saudi Arabia. And I was, you know, 10 years old, 11 years old, 12, and he lived right next door. And uh, I you know, knew him as one of my father's co-workers. I didn't know he was a CIA officer. I just thought he was a foreign service officer, a diplomat like my father. Um, but I remembered him, he was very handsome, tall. He played basketball across the street. He had two little babies, his wife was, uh, a gorgeous blonde woman. And uh, so I had these memories of him. And then I knew that he had died tragically in the in a truck bombing attack on the US Embassy in Beirut in 1983. And you know, when that happened, I was aware that he had died there. And, um, and I'd always been curious about how that had happened. Um, so I'm sitting in Kathmandu looking for a new book project. And I <clears throat> went on the internet and with the very slow internet speed that existed then <laughs> in Kathmandu and went on to Google and Googled his name. And actually I found a court case where his widow and the widows and survivors of the Beirut embassy attack from 1983 had sued filed a civil suit in US courts against the, the Islamic Republic of Iran. And you could read the transcripts of this testimony. And there was this testimony by Robert Ames's widow, Yvonne. Um, and it was very moving. It was very emotional describing, you know, how she got the news that her husband had been killed in this, truck bomb attack. And uh, there were all sorts of details. And, um, and so it made me think, oh, you know, maybe there's a book here. Um, and I wasn't quite sure that I could do a biography, a full biography of a CIA officer because there'd be so little information. The CIA, you know, indeed never cooperated with me, never gave me any files or documents, but, uh, I thought initially I could do a, a good book about the attack on the US Embassy from public sources and such. But the more I got into it, um, it the more biographical it became. And I found his widow, who was then retired in North Carolina, and I interviewed her. And she gave me a lot of information. And she also eventually found some letters a box full of letters in an attic of her daughter's house that had been lying there for decades. And these letters were handwritten to her, to, to Yvonne from Bob, and they described some of his work. And it became, it became a uh, biography. And it's, it's a terrific sort of um, book in that it explains to you what the life of a CIA officer is day to day, um, how boring it can be, how dangerous it could be. <laughs> and he actually played a significant role historically in US relations with the Palestinians and the, Pal the Palestine Liberation Org Organization, the PLO, which no American diplomat was allowed to have any contact with in the 60s and 70s and 80s, but a spy could. And so this became a sort of secret back channel between Robert Ames and 
uh, his PLO contacts in Beirut. So it was a, it's a fabulous story and a, uh, a good example of how biography can teach you uh, a lot of history. Right. And again, you being American yourself, and like you mentioned, Robert Ames had been a neighbor of yours when you were a little kid. Were there any times where you felt particularly emotional while writing the biography? Or are there any particular techniques that you use to kind of distance your own personal judgments and ensure that they don't come in the way of telling a good story? Well, you know, no, the answer is with regard to Ames, you know, I had childhood memories of him, but they're distant. He, he wasn't a personal friend, unlike, for instance, my mother and father who were um, who knew him much better than I did. Um, he was just a, a neighbor. Uh, <laughs> um, but you're right, you know, uh, biography in particular, but all history is very subjective. And, you know, it's my story about, if I were to write your biography, it would be my story about your life, not yours. <laughs> I would be making the choices of what I thought was interesting or important. And, um, you know, that's true of any biography. Um, in terms of my own emotions, um, I think I had more trouble writing a memoir, my childhood memoir, Crossing Mandelbaum Gate, where I have a chapter, for instance, about Cody Canal and all. Mm -hmm. um, that was much more difficult to figure out how to tell the story and what to remember um, and what to trust of my memories. <laughs> right. So uh, for instance, I, the book is based, that memoir is based on my memories, but also newspaper articles, history books, uh, and also my parents, my, in particular, my mother's correspondence and her letters to her, her parents describing our lives in Jerusalem and Cairo and Beirut. And, and she, you know, she was a, a prolific letter writer. Um, and she would often talk about what I was doing or how I was reacting to life in Jerusalem or Cairo. And at one point, in my writing, in, in my manuscript, I would occasionally share with my mother, who I was using her correspondence to write this book in part. And uh, I tell a story about an incident in, that happened in Jerusalem when I was a young boy. And uh, so I shared the manuscript with her and she wrote back to me and said, no, no, Kai, it didn't happen that way. <laughs> this is how it happened. And I had to write back to her and say, but mom, you, I'm writing your, this story based on your letters. She says, no, what I wrote that, no, I have a different memory of this, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it was her memory versus her, her letters from 1956. Okay. Uh, and you know, that's, that's what happens all the time in writing human history. Uh, you never know what to trust. Now, maybe, maybe her memory was, had changed over the years and she, but she was certain that her memory was better, a more accurate des description of that story than her own letter. I don't know, it's, so you have to make, you have to, that's why you have to have many sources coming from all different angles and try to piece together the puzzle. And, but you never get the whole truth, of course. It's very okay. difficult. The question that I had kind of related to your work on Robert Ames, because like you mentioned, it's been a part of human history. Everyone loves spies. We're fascinated by them. We want to know what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. And topics like these, at least today, they make really good content for a series on Netflix. 
is that something you've ever considered like converting your books into a more you know visual medium to so say as a series or as like a movie of sorts is that something you've ever considered something you've been approached to do oh absolutely <laughs> you know i i i think the written word is um actually more truthful than any movie can be on the other hand, sometimes, you know, the visual image can capture the emotional truth in, in, in a way that, you know, well, we all love movies. Anyway, so yes, uh, <clears throat> my Oppenheimer book has been optioned for a film, not once, but like four or five times. And ever since it came out in 2005, by 2006, it, that they were, there was a group of people who were trying to turn it into a movie. No one's been successful. Uh, there have been three scripts written. Um, they pay me a little tiny bit of money each year to, for the right, the option to make a film, um, but no film has ever been hired. Likewise, when The Good Spy came out, you're right. I think um, you're absolutely right. It would make a good movie. <laughs> it's very visual. It's a spy story, right? Um, <clears throat> and at the year it came out, um, a uh, young, very good pro uh, film producer appro approached me and bought the option. And he got a script written. And it's uh, been rewritten several times and edited, and we've gotten very close to signing up some big star to play Robert Ames, and it's all fallen apart. Problem is that uh, Hollywood is filled with people who have high hopes and dreams, and, and they're all very optimistic. Yes, we're going to do this, but they're, <clears throat> there are very, very few, I think one out of every hundred film options ever gets made. Um, another question I had was also that um, from, I guess your works in general and just your presence on social media, you seem to have kept quite a close eye on you know, events in US relations, in particular with countries in the Middle East. And I wanted to know just how much of your childhood played a part in the formation of your opinions and your interest in politics. Sure, um, you know, my earliest memories, childhood memories are of Jerusalem. Um, and my, that was my father's first posting as a diplomat. He was, you know, very young in his late 20s mm -hmm. when he arrived there. And he fell in love with Jerusalem in particular, but the Middle East. He became an Arabist. He learned the language. Um, and, you know, then I spent mo most of my childhood and, and then my last two years of high school in India. And uh, so I was growing up in Jerusalem and in Cairo where we were evacuated during this 1967 war. Um, and we were evacuated in the 56 war in Jerusalem. Um, you know, we had to leave quickly on an airplane because the war, uh, in, in both wars. Uh, anyway, you know, the, the conflict, the Arab-Israeli conflict was always there as a sort of back, background to my childhood. Um, and so when I, as I grew older, you know, at Cody, I, you referred earlier to this paper I wrote as a senior, it was a long hundred page type written paper about the history of Palestine. Um, and I was obsessed with the Arab-Israeli conflict and the Palestinian issue. And then in college, I went and took a junior, well, it was my sophomore year abroad and I went back to Beirut 
and attended the American University of Beirut and studied there for a year, studied Arabic. Um, I was never very good at it. And, um, and uh, but that year in Beirut, you know, my, my girlfriend from Cody, who I was deeply in love with, uh, Joy Riggs, uh, paid me a visit, a surprise visit, knowing that I was in Beirut and she was on her way back from India to the United States. And her plane got hijacked. Oh. And she was, uh, she landed in Beirut on the, at the international airport. And as it happened, I was in a little village right above the airport, looking down, studying Arabic that week. And this is in September of 1970. And I was listening to BBC on the radio and they were reporting that a plane had just been hijacked and it was on the tarmac in Beirut and I could see it mm -hmm. so, along with some of my classmates there. And so this was quite exciting. And then we see it take off. And a few hours later, I got a phone call saying that my girlfriend Joy from Cody was on that plane and she was a hostage along with all the other passengers. They flew her to a desert airfield in Northern Jordan and she was held captive for four days on that plane. And then at the end of the four days, the Palestinian guerrillas, they were guerrillas from the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the PFLP. And uh, they ordered all the passengers off the plane running. And at, when they were several hundred yards away, they blew up all three planes. They had hijacked three planes and landed them there. They, and they blew up all three of them. And no one was killed, but it was obviously a very traumatic experience. Well, Joy, my girlfriend, gorillas, uh, had talked to me, you know, and learned from me about the plight of the Palestinian people. <laughs> and yet here she was being held hostage. Was a... So there were many ironies involved. So I, I wrote about that story in Crossing Mandelbaum Gate. And yeah, that, the, you know, my childhood in the Middle East has, has affected me profoundly. I'm still... I pick up the newspaper every morning and I look for the news from Jerusalem and Israel and mm -hmm. the West Bank. And uh, part of the reason I wrote the book on Bob Ames is because it was all about the Arab-Israeli conflict. And part of the reason that I chose to do this book on, on Jimmy Carter, the outlier, is that Carter you know, became obsessed when he, walked into the Oval Office in 1977 and tried to spend a lot of time negotiating an Arab-Israeli peace. And he was partially successful at Camp David with the Camp David Accords of 1978. Um, and so a lot of the book is also about the Middle East. So yes, the, my childhood, you know, our childhoods always affect us. <laughs> Because you mentioned your latest book, that is The Outlier, The Life and Presidency of Jimmy Carter. Um, I'll just start with a question that's probably in a lot of people's minds. Of all the US presidents, why Jimmy Carter? Um, well, one reason, just obviously, there are very few books about him. So there was a vacuum. Um, Carter was president from 77 to 1981, early 81. And that was a time when I was, you know, in my late twenties working as a freelance journalist here in Washington and in New York as an editor at the Nation magazine. So I had memories of living through his presidency. And uh, I remember I was, sort of a critic from the left of Carter. I thought he was not liberal enough. Mm -hmm. I wondered why he was so, you know, he was a Democrat, but 
a liberal southerner, but uh, you know, I, I was impatient. Um, and so when he was defeated, and his defeat in 1980 to Ronald Reagan opened you know, the door to a very conservative chapter in American presidential politics. And Reagan was you know, a hard swing to the right. Um, I was curious about why this had happened and what had happened during his presidency that had prepared the way for the Reagan revolution. And uh, so in 1990, after I was almost finished with my McCloy biography, I was looking, knowing I was unemployable. <laughs> That's the term. <laughs> uh, I was looking for another book project and uh, I thought maybe Carter, you know, a president would be an interesting subject and it might be a book that could sell, find a commercial market. Um, and so I went down to Atlanta and interviewed a bunch of his people at the Carter Center that had just opened and interviewed him briefly on the telephone. And I wrote a magazine profile about all the great things that he was doing with his ex-presidency, trying to wipe out guinea worm disease. And, um, but that was in 1990, but I decided that the archives were still closed. He's, most of his papers, his presidential papers were classified. And it, it just, and, and also it seemed like such a foreign country, Georgia. Mm -hmm. I, I knew nothing about the South. I knew nothing about white and black relations, racial relations, it's particularly in the South. And I didn't know, actually, I, I, I didn't know much about his religion. Um, his born again Christianity. Although Cody had given me a little insight into this because I, I remember having you know a roommate at Cody who claimed that he was born again. And he was a Southern Baptist from Oklahoma, I think. And we would have these late night discussions about religion and whether you could take the Bible literally or not, or was it the word of God? And so I was actually familiar with, and, and that's due to my experience at Cody. Um, you know, I could talk to these people, but still it was strange, it was foreign. I didn't, I, so I backed off of it. This is in 1990, but several books later, um, in 2015, I finally came back to the subject. And by that time, the presidential archives were much more open. Um, his papers had been largely declassified. And um, there was still no good biography of Carter. And uh, so I wrote a proposal, sold it. And a month later, he had a press conference announcing that he had brain cancer. And I thought, well, I'll never see him. I'll never get to interview him. But he survived. There was a medical cure, a miracle. <laughs> he's now, he's survived the, the brain cancer. And so I did indeed have uh, five or six good interviews with him. And um, again, because you mentioned you were able to interview Jimmy Carter to write the book. Um, has he read your book yet? Oh, um, I think he's been listening to it. You know, he's 96 years old now right. and uh, he's had several falls and he's in, he's in ailing health. Um, mm -hmm. I just saw him about two weeks ago in Plains, okay. Georgia. I flew down there for his 75th wedding anniversary. Mm -hmm. He and Rosalind. And uh, I got a chance to shake his hand again and thank him for his cooperation. And, um, and I had sent him a copy of the book inscribed and such, and he sent me a nice little note thanking me for the inscription. So I don't know if he's actually read it, but many of his aides have read it and they are enthusiastic in their praise of the book. <laughs> so. Right. 
And coming to the title of the book, The Outlier, why did you find it a significant title in relation to Jimmy Carter? What aspects did you think made him worthy of the title, The Outlier? Um, well, <clears throat> he is an outlier in that he's an outsider. He grew up in the South in a segregated racist culture, but largely because of his mother's influence. Mm -hmm. He, though he, all his childhood friends were African-Americans, he really had a no racist sensibility in him. He understood that he was equal with African-Americans. And um, so he was an outlier in Southern segregated society. He was an outsider. But to me, the name outlier it's a great title because it's short and punchy. And so that's, that's good for a title. Um, but it, it captures who he is. He's an outlier politically, culturally. Um, he was a politician who knew how to win, but a politician who didn't want to make political deals. He wanted to do the right thing. He had a very moralistic approach mm -hmm. to using the power of the presidency to do the right thing. That made him an outlier, but I also, to, I confess, I, I, uh, I think I got the title from Malcolm Gladwell's book of some ten years ago called the Out, the Outliers, I think it was called. And it's a book about geniuses and um, what makes them different from other people. And that's exactly what Carter is. He is, a, he's, he's a, not a genius, but he's certainly, I think, a, one of the smartest presidents America has had in the last hundred years. And certainly the most hardworking and decent. Um, but he was also, outlier suggests that he, it's a self-chosen decision to be an outsider. It's not, you know, he chose to do this. He chose to be um, different. And he chose not to be an ordinary politician when he won the presidency. So the title fits and it's, as I said, short, and punchy and memorable. <laughs> okay. And just in general, getting onto the actual content of the book, We've seen that America's kind of just written off Carter's presidency as a bit of a failure to the extent where he's, you know, ranked really low on approval ratings. And in like recent polls, he's been listed among the worst American presidents of all time. Is this what you've discovered through your research? No. Do you think he was as much <laughs> a failure as the rest of America does? No. No, he, uh, he has that reputation and many Americans to this day will sort of concede that he uh, is probably a great ex-president, that he used his ex-presidency in a good way with the Carter Center doing humanitarian things like building houses for Habitat for Humanity and monitoring elections overseas and trying to bring peace to the Syrian civil war and mm -hmm. trying to negotiate peace with between the Arabs and Israelis and um, wiping out Guinea worm disease. But they say, well, he was a good and decent ex-president, but a failed presidency. And what they mean is largely that he was defeated by Ronald Reagan. So he was only a one-term presidency. Um, and then he was, a, <clears throat> they remember the long gas lines from the energy crisis. And they associate him with that. Um, and they associate him with the humiliation of the Iran hostage crisis that lasted 444 days during his presidency and only ended on the day that Reagan was inaugurated. Uh, <clears throat> so he's, uh, a victim of historical events. But in fact, when you go into the archives and see what actually he accomplished, it's a long list. He passed more legislation than Obama did during his two terms. He passed more legislation than Bill Clinton did. Um, and 
it's significant legislation. He deregulated natural gas. He deregulated the airline industry, which in the late 70s made it possible for middle-class Americans to fly regularly on a routine basis because prices came down. Uh, he jump-started the solar power energy industry. He uh, opened up uh, food, the food stamp program to 3 million recipients, largely African-Americans mm -hmm. in the South. Uh, he accomplished quite a bit. And on the foreign policy ledger, he did Camp David, he negotiated the SALT II arms control agreement. <clears throat> he passed the Panama Canal Treaty. Um, you know, so it's, an, it's a very impressive record actually. And mm -hmm. it's just forgotten. And uh, I think my book and history will uh, eventually result in his reputation as the president rising. Another question that I had in general, without getting too political, what do you think makes a good president? Because in recent times, we've seen a trend of leaders that are extremely populist, really good orators, and you know, they're borderline dictator-like. So in that sort of context, do you think a personality like Carter would be able to stand his ground in today's political sphere? If not, what do you think it takes to make a good president today? Well, if Carter was running today, he'd never get elected. <laughs> he, he's too decent and truth-telling a, a personality. Um, but, you know, in the wake of the Trump presidency, Carter's presidency is looking really good. Um, and I would think that most Americans in the wake of watching you know, being exhausted watching the Trump presidency, the, the daily soap opera, the histrionics, the, the lies, the craziness. Well, Carter was none of that. Carter was a guy who got up at 5.30 every morning, was in the Oval Office by 6.30 or 7, spent 12 hours working, uh, read 200 to 300 pages of memos every day, scribbling in the margin, his comments. Um, yeah, he was extremely hardworking, uh, paid attention to detail and tried to understand each issue. Um, and that's exactly what you think we'd want in any political leader. Okay. Um, and, you know, he was, he campaigned in 1976 saying, I will never tell you, tell a lie. I will never lie to the American people. Mm -hmm. his, his close uh, political advisor and, and longtime lawyer, Charlie Curbo, when he heard that, he said, uh oh, there goes the liar vote. He's just lost the liar vote. <laughs> And it was sort of true. <laughs> you know, people uh, are often very cynical about their politicians and suspicious, you know, that they are lying, being lied to. Carter didn't lie to people. Um, you know, he, he could sometimes exaggerate, but he never lied. Um, I've seen a critical comment of you that says that called you rather a romantic trying to educate the public about failed intelligence or political decision makers, which I think probably has to do in the context of, you know, your work on, say, Jimmy Carter. Um, what would you reply to a comment like this? And do you find yourself sometimes trying to create historical documents for us to understand why people have failed? Do you think your work in particular has kind of lean towards explaining failure in recent times? Uh, well, explaining failure, you know, I, I've chosen the subjects that I have because I have a deep personal curiosity. I want to figure out why 
the Vietnam War happened. When I was a young man, I was, you know, subject to being drafted into this war that I mm -hmm. thought was crazy. So I wanted to know why this happened. That's what motivated me to write a biography of McGeorge Bundy, who was the national mm -hmm. security advisor to Kennedy and Johnson and one, was one of the major architects of the war. And he was particularly interesting to me because he was a liberal. Mm -hmm. He was an intellectual. He was a Harvard dean. He wasn't stupid. So how did he do something so get drawn into something that was such a tragedy and so on the face of it, idiotic, you know. Um, so yes, I'm interested in failure. And I was interested in Oppenheimer's life for this reason, because he symbolizes the nuclear age, which is, you know, a, an age that we're still living with and the end story is still unknown. Is this bomb ever gonna be used again? Mm -hmm. Was it used in the first instance justifiably or not? I don't think so, but it was, you know, it was a weapon that, that cannot be uninvented. And it was going to, you know, human beings are, are curious mammals and they will discover things and they discovered sure. in time they would have discovered the atomic bomb and now the problem is how do we live with this and if Hiroshima was a failure as I think it was a failure of hum human imagination mm -hmm. a failure of the pol political decision making um, what can we learn from that okay. um, and likewise, I chose Robert Ames because I thought he, his life as a CIA officer would shed some light on, you know, the failures of intelligence, the failures of U.S. policymakers in the Middle East in particular. So, yes, <laughs> failure is an interesting subject. <laughs> I'm just going to move on to the next segment, which is basically just a little rapid fire about your time at Kobe. So don't take too long between these answers. I'll just give okay. you like maybe five <laughs> seconds to think about your time in Kobe. But okay, we'll start off easy. Which house team color were you a part of? Which house? Uh, yeah, for sport. Oh, which sport? Which team uh, color I were you a part of? I have no memory. I don't know. See, I wasn't into sports. I can't even remember playing sports. <laughs> okay. What was the name of your dog? Wissy. Oh, you were in Wissy. You know it's a girl's dorm now? <gasps> no, it was a boy's dorm then. It's a girl's dorm now. <laughs> okay. Who was your dorm parent? Uh, the... The ah, Weebies, the Weebies. Okay, who was your high school best friend? Uh, my high school best friend was no doubt my girlfriend, Joy Riggs. <laughs> okay, what was your go to outfit for school? My go-to outfit, I think, you know, baggy corduroy pants and, and uh, a rumpled jacket, I don't, you know. I think I was always cold in Cody. Right, <laughs> it's on the top of the hill, it gets quite cold. Yeah. Okay, where was your roommate from? Uh, he was, my roommate, in my senior year, you know, I had several, but mm -hmm. uh, he was from Ohio. Okay. And what was the worst thing about your roommate? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was a very strange fellow who uh, practiced Buddhist meditation. <laughs> and he could get into the lotus position and completely zone out 
And you know how boys can be cruel and play jokes. Uh, so he, the, his, uh, I never did this to him, but other boys would, while he was meditating, they would come up to him and poke him with a needle or put shaving cream on his head or, <laughs> and he would completely ignore it. Oh, wow, okay. Uh, who is your favorite teacher in Cody? I think Miss Mitchell. Interesting. Um, what was the best reading spot in Cody according to you? The best reading spot? Well, I loved walking out to the far, around the lake, to the far mm -hmm. end where there is an old British cemetery. Mm -hmm. And uh, the cemetery was very spooky and usually there was no one there. And I would sometimes take a book and sit under a tree and by a gravestone and read a book. <laughs> um. One thing you got into trouble for at school? Uh, <laughs> I ran for student council president. Okay. And my major platform was to abolish compulsory church. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought this was a, a winning platform that uh, it, you know, because as far as I could see, everyone complained about having to go to church, not only on Sunday morning, but on Sunday evening as well. And we were constantly being hoarded into the church and herded mm -hmm. into the church and, and for various religious events. And, it, you know, it was too much. And I thought it would be very popular and I would get elected. In fact, I lost in a landslide. All these Cody <laughs> missionary kids were appalled by my suggestion that, that church services should not be compulsory. <laughs> okay, what's one regret you have from your time in Cody? Uh, my one regret. Uh, You know, I probably should have gotten to know more about, I studied South, Indi South Indian history, and we went on some of these great field trips mm -hmm. to Madurai and um, to various old temple sites around, organized by that professor, that teacher, Miss Mitchell. Okay. But I wish I had sort of learn more history about Tamil Nadu. Okay. Um, what were your comments about school food? My, my what? What did you think of school food? Uh, <clears throat> it was pretty horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I did acquire a taste for South Indian food. I, I grew to love the spicy curries and uh, papadams and, you know, sweet milky tea. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the food was, let's say, erratic. Um, which teacher had the biggest impact on you, positive or negative? Well, again, Miss Mitchell um, was a history professor, taught Indian history. Um, and, you know, she really tapped my interest in history. And she gave me this, gave me permission to do this independent study where I wrote this long 100 page paper on Palestinian history and culture. Um, so I, I credit her a lot. There was also, I forget his name now, but there was a professor, a, a teacher from Canada who mm -hmm. also taught a history course in Canadian history. And it was, I thought very interesting because it, it was really about North American history, but from the perspective of the Canadian. Okay. So uh, 
it was all about how many times the Americans had invaded Canada as aggressors. <laughs> so you suddenly saw, you know, the War of 1812 from a different perspective, and it taught you mm -hmm. that history is subjective. I suddenly realized, well, you know, different. It depends on where you're standing. Okay. And just my last question, if you had only one word to describe your time at Cody, what would it be? Uh, well, I was always an outlier, like Jimmy Carter. <laughs> <laughs> I was a strange, I was a diplomat kid among all these missionary kids. Um, and it was, I, I always felt you know, a little bit of a stranger. Okay. But I enjoyed it. It was, you know, it was a formative experience. Glad I went. And I will add, you know, I have one son, only one child. He's now 28. He's an industrial designer. Um, and his name is Joshua, but his middle name is Cody. Oh. K-O-D-A-I. Okay. It was, uh, uh, when he was born, it was sort of a nod to that experience. Okay, that's really sweet. <laughs> so. But, right, that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. It's been really insightful talking to you. Okay, well, you're a great interviewer. You should, Thank you so much. You should have a, a great career in journalism or, or history. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.